Um, all right, I don't know, uh, judges, uh, whether you were here, and Honorable uh, Mr. Farr, I don't know if you were here previously um, when we uh, were doing the other panel, but essentially let me welcome you all. Thank you very much for being here and taking your time to be here. Um, the way we are functioning is that I would ask each of you to make an opening statement. Um, we've gotten your written submissions if you've given us one, um, and so we've been able to look at those, so we're not really asking you to read off of those, but just to sort of give us an idea of what it is you would like to talk about. Um, and then we're going to open it up to the uh, actual uh, committee members to ask you questions about your concerns. Um, and then at the conclusion of each of, and there's only four uh, committee members sitting with, here with me um, that will be asking you questions. At, at the very end of the session, um, then I'm going to open it up so that if any other committee member has a follow-up question they might want to ask you after hearing your testimony, uh, they'll be given the opportunity to do that. So so with that being said, um, we'll start with you, Mr. Fer Ferrar. Ferrer. Ferrer. Um, since you are first up, um, we'll let you go ahead and start. Thank you. And good afternoon, uh, Judge Cardone and distinguished members of the committee. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and, and it's a, a real privilege for me to address you today as the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Florida. I welcome uh, your questions on our observations of the operations and the management of the CJA program. Uh, I will tell you that I really do think that by, and I am sure that by considering the unique characteristics of our district, that will hopefully help all of us in our efforts, our joint efforts, to make sure that um, those who are eligible uh, to get the CJA assistance get it and that they get effective uh, legal representation. So I thank you. And I will tell you that for the last um, five and a half years, I have had the honor of overseeing the operations of the third largest United States Attorney's Office in the country. I will tell you that the Southern District of Florida, and these judges I'm sure will agree with me, we have a wide uh, range of complex cases that come through this district. We are also one of the busiest uh, districts in the country. Our office, for example, uh, handles more trials uh, than any other district, and it's been the case for many years. And a lot of that is due to the nature of the cases and because we have a wonderful defense bar. Uh, and, and so we are very, very active. For example, just to give you an example, in, in a narcotics uh, sort of uh, section, we handle not just domestic but many international uh, drug trafficking uh, investigations. Though the international uh, cases in particular really always amount to a lot of overseas witness preparation, countless hours of uh, translation and, and uh, issues that we have with uh, foreign speakers. In our economic crime section, we are unfortunately here in South Florida plagued with a lot of fraud. Sometimes they call us the fraud capital of the United States because of the Medicare fraud issues, identity theft cases, and a lot of cyber issues and other threats that we face down here in South Florida. We confront them uh, with the resources that we have, and those cases always as well, because the schemes are so elaborate, they always will lead to a vast amount of discovery and, and evidence that needs to be analyzed. And in, in addition to that, we obviously uh, also have a very vigorous uh, uh, issues here in prosecutions of public corruption and human trafficking and a lot of other uh, terrorism and national security cases that, that we have to face. So as the cases in South Florida have evolved to more complex schemes and much more elaborate schemes, so too I believe the demands on the attorneys that have to handle these cases in the Southern District of Florida have increased as well. Um, now as being in the United States Attorney's Office, we are obviously not in a position to be able to, uh, to really know about uh, the costs and, and how those decisions get made, but I can just assume that because of our cases getting more complex, that the costs uh, and the resources uh, needed have obviously increased in the last couple of years. Uh, and again, being mindful that this committee is looking at a court program and that we are in an adversarial uh, system, I'm not here to presume or, or to veer out of, out of my lane um, uh, on how such a program should be run, but I am here to definitely to give my observations and to support 
this effort and to make sure that uh, I can, to the best of my ability, let you know what we are seeing so that we could um, improve and, and make the system even better. Because if there's something that I have no doubt about is that for both sides of the aisle, we need the best and most qualified attorneys who can handle uh, either you know, more uh, single defendant cases, but also the multi-defendant types of cases. Um, attorneys that are diverse and, and, and again, well qualified and able to intelligently and, 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 ad and, and carefully and thoughtfully advocate for their clients. And I will also say that just as the Department of Justice seeks to recruit the most qualified lawyers, um, the same would hold true for the CJA panel. And finally, um, having practiced, I've been uh, a line AUSA here for over six years, and now it's been five and a half years as a U.S. attorney, and also having canvassed the office before appearing here today, I will tell you that the CJA panel here in the Southern District of Florida uh, has a very solid and good reputation in having attorneys that are thoughtful, professional, and who do a very good job uh, in court. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you and I welcome any questions. All right, Judge Hobbs. Okay, thank you. Glad to be here today. I'm sorry that I, ha I started taking medication for pneumonia at the end of last week and would not be here except that we <laughs> sort of thought that it would be important that we have someone here today. I can see everybody separating. <laughs> and I hope, I, I hope that I'm understandable uh, today. Uh, my background is that um, shockingly I began practicing law in uh, 1976 in private practice and uh, practiced until 1980 when I went with the United States Attorney's Office as an assistant United States Attorney. I stayed there for 12 years doing various things. At that time in the Western District, there were no divisions. I did civil and criminal work, was head of the Drug Task Force for a period of time, was Chief Assistant <coughs> United States Attorney, and tried numerous cases. Because we had to eat what we killed, we took all of our cases to the Fourth Circuit individually and wrote briefs, and I appeared numerous times before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, during my time there, I probably am most famous for having pushed the boundaries of harmless air to their natural outside limits. <laughs> um, then in 1992, I went back into private practice. And uh, in, the, in that time, represented numerous criminal defendants in state and federal court. I. Um, Spent a great deal of time doing criminal work. I did some plaintiff's work as well when, when the opportunity arose, but most of it, I would say, was criminal work, state and federal. During those two stints, both my stint before the U.S. Attorney's Office and during that stint, I did indigent work. I did a great deal of it at first, albeit not very well, I don't think, uh, in looking back on it, and then did some from 92 to 95, but I had so many cases coming to me that I got paid in, that I had to watch and be careful that I didn't take someone who didn't pay and miss out on someone who would pay, quite frankly. Then in 1995, I became a United States Magistrate Judge. I did that from 95 until 2004, at which time I went back into private practice. Practiced uh, doing civil and criminal work until 2011, when I was appointed by President Obama to the, to the bench and successfully navigated through the Senate process. I'm here primarily today on a necessity by, by our, the judges in our district who want to make it absolutely clear that in our switchover from a CDO to an FDO, all we want to do is take care of criminal defendants and see to it that they get the best representation that they can. And the reason that I am here is that it has been, it has been published about and has continued to be published about that for some reason we wanted someone with one year experience out of law school, a law clerk, to get the job, and that the only reason we did that was to control the local CDO. Now that makes a lot better story in getting the masses up and together than the fact that the judges chose the only experienced trial lawyer that was before them at that time, the only truly experienced trial lawyer that was before them at that time, right or wrong, when they made their recommendation to the board of the CDO. But it is untrue to say that that person had one year of experience. That person was a, had been a, a federal, federal uh, defender for over 20 years, had appeared in numerous criminal trials, had appeared before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals on a number of occasions, 
and it argued before the United States Supreme Court. In place of that person, the board wanted to put someone they knew who uh, had only, had, had, during, their, during their entire time, with the Defender Office had not tried a criminal trial. <clears throat> now there may be some who think that an administrator needs to only be someone who can administrate and has to have no trial experience. But if you're going to administrate trial attorneys, you may not need to be the best trial attorney, but you need to have been in the courtroom and know what these other folks are going through. I've been there. I've had arrogant prosecutors who've mistreated me. I've had judges who've mistreated me. I've had to try to convince juries of very difficult things. I've had defendants that have lied to me. Until you've had all of those things occur to you, you can't know what, what those folks are going through when they're out there, and they're going through a tough time. It is hard to be a defense attorney. It is very, very hard to be a defense attorney. Um, I've done it, and those who have done it for years and years and years, uh, like the gentleman who's, who's done it for 50 years, uh, are to be commended for, for their dedication and for what they do for the system. But that's all we care about in our district is to have that happen. When I first came on, uh, there were some complaints about our defender services, but I, it really wasn't, a, wasn't a much of a moment to me. And shortly after I came on, we, we picked, there was a new director picked, and they told us they were picking from these two people and that they had selected one of the two. One of the people was the one who ultimately was selected director by the CDO later on. On this occasion, they picked the other person who was the most experienced person. Sounded good to me. They weren't asking me really for anything except did I have any comments to make, and I didn't. Moved on. Uh, there, were, there was some complaint from one of the judges. Judge Conrad kept saying that why, why do when I ask for, a, for uh, a, someone with, as a paralegal, excuse me, as a pro se law clerk, I get 100 plus applications for that job and for federal defender in this district, we get 12 applications. I didn't have an answer for him and really didn't think about it until this second one came up. And with some of the troubles that we had had with the CDO, which do not need to be gone into at this point because they would take too long, uh, we thought we needed the, the best decision needed to be made the next time. And when given the opportunity to interview the candidates that the, that the board gave to us, we saw, looked at who the candidates were we made the best decision that we thought for the district. And they went the other way. They were going the other way, it was clear, from the very start. We were just a stop in the road. And at that point, once again, Judge Conrad said, look at how few applications they had. And we said, let's look at an FDO and see what that is. And when you look at the FDO, rather than be a situation which is under the control of the judges, under the current CDO, the judges have to be, are able to pick or able to veto whoever is on the board. So the judges can continually veto board members until they take control of a local CDO. Under an FDO, it is the function of the Court of Appeals to insulate the FPD from involvement of the district court. They want commit, the committee of, the selects it to be persons knowledgeable in federal criminal defense issues, not including probation, pretrial services, law enforcement, prosecutorial personnel, members in good standing of the bar of the state admitted to practice, a minimum, a minimum of five years of criminal practice, preferably with significant federal criminal trial experience. If those rules had been in effect at the CDO, neither of the, the last two directors we had would have been selected. That is why we did it, right or wrong. We cared about the criminal defendants that were coming before us having good representation. That's all we cared about. That story has continued to go forward. A federal defender came back for me from Santa Fe to say that two federal defenders that she had spoken to had come up to her to say, we hear this terrible things going on with your judges in your district. She said, you're wrong. They said, well, didn't they, didn't they wish, want to get a law clerk with one year experience appointed? She said, no, it's Tom Cochran. He has over 20 years. They knew who he was. So the fact that that, that rumor has not been squashed uh, brought me down here and we felt like we needed to come down here. Now I do have some opinions on some of this other and I'll be glad to answer questions, but that's what I'm down here. If, you're, if, the if this matter is about the truth, then it needs to be told and that's the truth. All right, thank you, Judge Cogburn. Okay. Judge Scola. All right, 
Judge Cardone and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity. On behalf of the judges of the Southern District of Florida, I want to welcome you to our district. Um, I started out as a prosecutor for Janet Reno when she was our state attorney and uh, was there for six and a half years. And then I was a criminal defense attorney for almost 10 years. I had a significant federal practice, but I also did a lot of court appointed cases in state courts. And one of the things that I learned is that when somebody gives you $25,000 or $50,000 to represent them, you're starting out there, that act of payment is a statement of trust that they have in you that's yours to lose. Uh, but when you're appointed by the court and you're sent over to the jail or have the person come to your office to meet you, you know, there's a lot of skepticism. You have to earn the trust uh, of your client. And I think it's very important, and we as a court and, and as a system, uh, it's very important that we make sure that we have people who are serving in that role, not only who are competent and capable, but who have the passion okay, to want to fight on behalf of the defendants. And uh, when I uh, was appointed to the federal bench after 16 years on the state court bench, four and a half years ago, um, the one thing that I asked our the chief judge to do is to appoint me, if he could, to the CJA panel committee as our liaison, because that was an uh, an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. And we, uh, as uh, Willie Ferrer told you, we are very fortunate that we have uh, an abundance, almost an overabundance, of very qualified uh, criminal defense attorneys here in South Florida. And we, I think part of it is because we have so many complicated cases and complex cases that go to trial, and we have a lot of lawyers that end up having a lot of trial experience, both in state and in federal court. And when uh, Three years ago, when we started a new process for uh, applications for the wheel, um, there were 11 openings on the panel, and we had 80 applicants. And some of the people who did not get on the panel were literally 20 and 25 year lawyers who had been public defenders or state attorneys and had over 200 uh, trials as a pro as prosecutor or a criminal defense attorney, and they did not get on the panel because we had 11 other people that were more qualified and more experienced than they were. So we really do have a great uh, depth and breadth of qualified lawyers uh, here in, in South Florida. And I think our bench is committed to making sure that those uh, lawyers are supported and have the resources to do the job that they uh, are called upon to do. And I, I was here for most of the previous panel. I know there's a lot of uh, issues uh, and concerns that people have about what type of uh, supervision or involvement at all that uh, judges have in the process, and I'm sure that those will be the questions, and I'll wait to answer them uh, during the course of the presentation this afternoon. And Judge Graham. Good afternoon, Judge Cardone. Committee members, staff members, welcome to the Southern District of Florida. We're sorry it's a little chilly today. <laughs> <laughs> but for some of you, that may be a good thing. Uh, we really appreciate your efforts. I have served on a judicial conference committee and I know the time and effort that you have to spend <coughs> in this type of venture is difficult. You do have another job and so we appreciate you all being here and working as hard as you do. We're also grateful that the Chief Justice had the foresight to commit to this project. I'm sure there are issues nationwide that you will resolve for us. I have listened to too many lawyers read openings and closings, so I'm not going to do that. I know that's the least effective way to communicate, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, I do have a fairly unique uh, perspective, like my colleague Bob Scola. I was an assistant U.S. attorney. He was an assistant state attorney for about four and a half years. I was a criminal defense lawyer for 10 years, practicing primarily in federal courts throughout the country, and I've been on the federal bench for 25 years. So any questions that you have, I'm happy to take a stab at it. The judges in the Southern District of Florida are, are very serious about our CJA panel. And we have done this for the last 15 or so years. We have a selection committee. I served on that committee in the same position that Bob is serving now. 
I know that the lawyers and the judges are very, very careful in making recommendations to the judges about who is qualified to be a member of the panel. And the judges take it very seriously. We actually have a judges meeting where we review the qualifications and applications of all of the lawyers. We have approximately 170 members on the panel and we review annually one third of those individually. And as you might imagine, the judges are not very shy about expressing their opinions about various lawyers and their work product. And so I think we have a very, very fine panel. We attempt to get skilled lawyers, ethical lawyers, and we don't have lawyers who are on the panel because they can't get work elsewhere. We have very prominent individuals, and I see a number of them here, I'm not sure why we always have to preach to the choir. There are a lot of other folk I would like to see here, <laughs> but I want to thank uh, those members of the panel who are present. You do an excellent job. Now, not everything is perfect in the Southern District of Florida. What are some of our problems? Well, as I see it, uh, we have a very diverse community, ethnically, based on religion, et cetera. And we could do a better job. I know as far as women of color, most of the women of color are with the Federal Public Defender's Office. So we judges and the panel members attempt to recruit people to become a member. And they also invite lawyers to second chair trials so that they can become qualified. And we also try to take a look at experience levels. We don't want everyone on the panel with 25 or 30 years of experience. We want some new lawyers who can learn, some mid-level experienced lawyers, and of course, the very serious uh, lawyers who have been with us for many, many years. And of course, not everyone wants to do criminal work, and then everyone who does criminal work doesn't necessarily want to be on a panel because of the, the finances. So we, we need to work, I think, on the diversity of our panel and do a better job there. We have some problems with getting lawyers in our Fort Pierce division on the panel. We sometimes have to recruit lawyers from West Palm Beach or Fort Lauderdale. This is very costly to the criminal justice system. So I know, and we've had problems, frankly, in West Palm Beach as well. I know that some of the judges in that division have gone to bar luncheons to speak about the problem, to try to encourage people to participate. Vouchers, that is probably uh, an issue that you hear a lot about. Some defense attorneys contend, and maybe rightfully so, that judges cut their vouchers unnecessarily. Uh, that is a problem. You know, some judges who practiced 35 years ago, they think that a $10,000 fee is a lot of money, when today it's perhaps not such a, a great fee. So we need to make sure that the lawyers understand what is happening, and I suspect that we probably need a, a national approach in looking at establishing guidelines for making a determination as to what should happen with our vouchers. Was the case extended? Was it complicated? Were the legal issues complicated? Those are all considerations. Now, I may be uh, a person that some of the lawyers have complained about. I hope not. <laughs> I, I, I do give every lawyer an opportunity to respond. If I intend to reduce a voucher, I will send a letter to the lawyer explaining that uh, I'm considering it and I'd like to hear from you and what you have to say. What troubles me is lawyer A, who is the lead attorney, who is very skilled, who does a great job, who's very efficient, submits a voucher for, let's say, $30,000 in a fairly complex case. Lawyer B, who didn't file any motions, 
who follow the lead of everyone else, who did a competent job, but files a voucher for $60,000. You know, I have a problem with that. I have to analyze what is it that caused this divergence in fee requests. And so I have to analyze it and make a determination. It would be nice if we had national guidelines in that regard. Of course, Every judge has to make a determination. Some people think judges shouldn't be making this determination at all. But, you know, we're the ones who view the trial, and I think we have the public's trust in mind and that the judges should be able to make a, a fair determination as to what a reasonable fee is. But I do think, as I stated, guidelines are important. Another area that I am interested in is the discovery area, as it has an impact on the Criminal Justice Act. As an assistant U.S. attorney back in 1980, the defense lawyers all complained about the lack of discovery. You know, we had all of these hearings, in my mind, unnecessary hearings, about the government not turning over discovery as they should. I always was, I was appalled at that. I remember as a judge, first case on the bench, there's an argument about discovery with a defendant's family in the spectator area. Can you imagine their impression? Oh, the government's trying to hide this or hide that. They're trying to railroad me, et cetera, which is probably not the case at all. But I do think that uh, the discovery issue is an expensive one for us. 35 years ago, we talked about the lack of discovery. Today, in 2015, we have too much discovery with electronic discovery and tape recordings, et cetera. The defense attorneys complain, we have too much. They talk about the dump truck method. The government drives up the dump truck, dumps off all of the discovery, you know, 5,000 documents, 50 tapes, and now we have to go through all of that to make a determination as to what's relevant or not. I think the judges have a role in that. The defense counsel have the obligation to have access and to review all of the discovery. But I think that the judges, and I do this, I ask the government, let's narrow the focus. Tell us the 300 documents that you likely will use. Tell us about the 25 tape recordings out of the 500 that you're likely to use so that you can narrow the focus. Sure, the defense has an obligation to look at everything, but you know, nowadays with the guidelines and the sentences, the first defendant in the door, as they say, is the one who gets the apple. We have a lot of cooperation created by the guidelines, et cetera. And so if you narrow the focus and give the defense attorneys an opportunity to see what the case is all about, you know, when you listen to those first 25 tape recordings where your defendant is talking about committing the crime, that gives the defense lawyer an opportunity to figure out what he or she wants to do and to make a determination. This can save a lot of money. As was stated by some of my colleagues and others, Willie in particular, we have a lot of fraud in this district. We have a lot of cases that are document intensive. We have a lot of large scale drug cases with hundreds of recorded conversations. Narrowing the focus will save the public a lot of money. And so, as we have new civil rules, which became effective December 1st, wherein they discuss proportionality, judges now in the civil arena have an obligation to fashion discovery and to consider cost, et cetera, in making determinations about what is to be discovered, the manner in which it's to be discovered in accordance with Rule 26. It may be that some rules in the criminal law area may be effective as well. Now, of course, no one is going to preclude the defendant from their Sixth Amendment right and the ability to view every document should they desire to do so. But I do think that we can narrow the scope and save time and effort. 
The new civil rules also address case management. They require judges to have early case management conferences, et cetera. Query whether this is necessary in the criminal law field. To be honest and direct, I do not know what happens in other districts. I think in the Southern District of Florida, the items that are created by the new civil rules are things that the judges in this district have been doing for years. And so we don't really have a problem with <coughs> case management and getting cases to trial uh, expeditiously. That may be a problem in other districts. And if it is, then it may be that similar case management rules as in the new rules of civil procedure should be implemented in the criminal sphere as well. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. All right, we're gonna start with Judge Fisher. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for being with us. I have a couple of questions for each of you. Let me start with Mr. Ferrer, because we've heard some things both in letters we've received in a little bit in testimony about a lack of parity or a per perceived lack of parity with uh, the U.S. Attorney's offices and in various things. There are some questions about whether the pay levels are the same and whether the staffing is the same. I don't think there's much we can do about those issues. Uh, but with regard to um, the discovery issues that have been mentioned and the accessibility to experts, I think the thought is that uh, with regard to discovery, there is this dump truck concept. And I've heard anecdotally that there are actually directives from Maine Justice about how you're to turn over uh, discovery and also that there are limitations on the amount of money that you can spend and the, the kinds of experts maybe you need to go get permission uh, from those uh, for that. So could you shed some light on those issues? What kind of directives do you get and are there really realistic limitations or do you basically get whatever you ask for? Well, in terms of our, our budgets and, and what we get and what we can ask permission for, every U.S. Attorney's Office gets a certain amount of money that we can use for litigation expenses. So sometimes, uh, I mean, and that's a historical approach depending on the size of the office. So we as being the third largest right now uh, in comparisons to other U.S. Attorney's Offices, we get uh, a pretty sizable budget. Our budget is around, uh, around $42 million, but 90% of that is for personnel, is to pay for our personnel and our staff. The remainder is for uh, these litigation expenses. In terms of the of the staffing uh, that you were talking about originally about the differences, uh, there is right now uh, discussions within the Department of Justice about different pay scales. If that's what you were talking about in, in terms of assistant U.S. attorneys on the field and then Department of Justice attorneys within Maine Justice, there's two different. They, they actually use two different scales. Uh, so, so in terms of disparity. Um, there is an analysis and uh, a review right now ongoing about where those disparities exist and, and, and about, about those issues. Uh, but, but just again, our offices, each office is given an amount of money and then they tell us you can spend up to that limit and that's it. In some exceptional cases, if we're running out of money and during a certain budget cycle and we need to ask for more, we can make a special request, but it's all going to depend on how much they have in their general uh, pot, uh, so to speak. Now, as to discovery, and that's an item, and just uh, to follow up with what Judge Graham was saying, um, the management of discovery is a real issue. It's absolutely a real, a real issue. Nowadays, uh, as opposed to decades ago, we have the ability, because of you know, the internet and, and all the electronic discovery, we actually have more than we used to have and access to more information and we also have an easier ability to disclose it and to turn it over. So our approach has been, because we do, want, we do not want to ever appear uh, to be hiding any ball, which we, we do not, and we have asked and we've, in our office, we ask our assistant U.S. attorneys to go beyond what's statutorily or constitutionally required in, dis in discovery. And that sometimes leads to the argument of, oh my goodness, now you're giving us way too much and, and you're not directing us. So our approach is to disclose what we have, 
within the rules and even beyond that, um, beyond that, and then to help guide the defendants and the defense attorneys to the documents uh, or, or the, because we're also fine tuning, as we get the discovery, it's also very daunting on us because we also have access to terabytes of discovery. We also have to go through it. So our approach has been, you turn it over, we as well start fine tuning it. And as Judge Graham said, and we have worked with judges and we have worked with, and when I was practicing, that's what I did, is that I would start narrowing it down and start looking at the, we call them the hot documents. And I would make a hot document index at the appropriate time when I actually was able to figure out what they were myself. And then we would start turning that over, or at least pointing the defendants uh, to that direction, because we understand that. We understand that that's, it's an impossible task. We also have, in, um, specifically now speaking of CJA issues as well, when we realize um, that there's a case, like Judge Graham said, where there are those 25 tapes, and, and it boils down to a certain subset of that discovery, we will do reverse proffers, which means we will ask the defendant uh, and the French attorneys to come to us, they are not to say a word, and we will then give them a presentation of what we think are the, the hottest uh, amount, you know, pieces of evidence. So we have tried to do that, and we're doing actually that more often, frankly, because of this problem that we're seeing. Um, so that's how we're trying to navigate this. One thing that I will throw out there, because I've, I've heard it from other U.S. attorneys' offices, and something that may be helpful in multi-defendant complex cases, is to have a discovery coordinator, if that is something that the CJA uh, would want to have. Someone where the defense counsel uh, doesn't feel or doesn't have to come to us for assistance, because with this discovery uh, issues comes a lot of technological challenges, different softwares, how to access it. Um, now at the Department of Justice, speaking of directives, uh, starting this Friday, um, there's gonna be more encryption on discovery that we turn over in removable media in order to protect uh, witnesses or victims or that information getting uh, uh, misplaced or, what, or whatnot and, and for the safety of a lot of victims and witnesses. So the, uh, we're actually learning how to you know, make sure that that uh, burden, because that's, that's something that exacerbates this problem, a discovery coordinator could possibly be somebody who can help navigate that uh, for the defense bar and make sure that uh, that the software is working, that they're able to access it, and we can all work together on that. That's just one idea that I have heard floated around and I think may not be actually a bad idea to help us with this discovery. I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I'm speaking too much, but. Uh, no, that's right. Are there, are there cases where in, in your district or maybe you've heard other, from other districts where uh, your assistants uh, looked at a case and, and wondered why the criminal defense lawyer, uh, panel lawyers mostly, uh, didn't have a certain kind of expert where you were thinking, gee, if I were a defense lawyer, I wonder if they, they didn't think about it or why they didn't get one. We're hearing a lot about CJA lawyers being concerned about asking for experts or maybe being denied experts. Are you seeing anything in your cases that might support that? Well, Judge, I, I canvassed the office. I, uh, I, I reached out to all of our, our section chiefs and division chiefs, and I asked them specifically that question because I know that that was one, er uh, one area that Judge Cardone <coughs> mentioned in her letter, uh, and we have not. I have not heard anyone say that a CJA attorney uh, had been denied an expert uh, in a particular case. Uh, again, there may be some instances. I just i am not aware of them, but I, I did ask, and I have not heard of that being a, 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 an issue in the Southern District of Florida. Thank you. Judge Cogburn, uh, you came here with a specific purpose of clarifying something, so I want to make sure I understand what you said. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you indicated, and I think you were saying that one of the reasons, or the main reason, or maybe the only reason why your district asked to change from CDO for FPD was that regardless of the particular person, you didn't approve of the choice of director? No, what, what, that, that's, that was the impetus that caused us to do it. What we did was when we looked at the FDO, we came up with a number of things that we looked at. Uh, we were not getting the quality of applicants, and we found that, that the, the folks, that most of the districts are FDOs. CDO is a, is a small percentage compared to the FDOs. In fact, 
Our district is the only district in the Fourth Circuit that is not an FDO. I heard the two FDO uh, folks from the Middle District of North Carolina and the Eastern District of North Carolina could only wish we had uh, FDOs of that quality. Um, but we, we, had, we, we looked at, we were not getting people to apply. We were not getting as, uh, assistance to come in. All of the agencies, the U.S. Attorney's Office is inundated with people wanting to move to Charlotte and Asheville. The FBI is inundated with people wanting to move to Asheville and Charlotte. Lots and lots of the federal agencies want to move to Charlotte. If we put an application for uh, a law clerk or a, um, a pro se law clerk to come in and, and do the work, we're inundated with those. Uh, the FDO applications, or the, F, the CDO applications, we're getting 12 or 14 people. Most of them really not qualified for the position. Because of the fact that you have to give up a federal retirement to come to a CDO which does not have a federal retirement, you have to give up the protections that, of being a federal employee that you have. They're not huge, but you've got, empl you've got employment protections there. To come to a CDO where you're an employee at will, we found that, uh, that this was a, we were being denied the, the, the quality of applicants we needed not only for the directorship but also for the assistant positions. Um, we, in looking into it, found that there's a conflict of interest which occurs between the panel that runs the CDO and the CDO when a panel attorney appears in a case with one, one of the members of the CDO. I heard the last group of, of attorneys talking about conflicts of interest. When an attorney appears with either a panel attorney or a member of the CDO, and they're representing folks, there is a potential conflict. And as soon as one of those people is offered a plea in order to testify against the well-heeled uh, client of the panel member, you've got a real serious problem. That does not exist in an FDO. We also were subjected to an embezzlement of money by the administrator of our CDO. The judges didn't find out about it for a long time. It was kept from the judges. In an FDO, that would have been reported to the circuit chief. Uh, but in the CDO, that was kept from us for a long period of time until after the investigation was done. You cannot embezzle from an FDO. It's run just like any other federal. You put in a, you put in a voucher and you get paid or you don't get paid. But there's no cash money to take. A CDO is essentially a block grant to criminal defense attorneys. Easy to embezzle from, uh, easily taken. We decided an FDO was better. We think it's also better for the employees because they're federal employees and they're protected and they're not at will. I, have, I, have, uh, I cannot mention the names of some uh, of, the, uh, of the members of our uh, CDO that talk to me because they're afraid that they'll be fired and they're afraid they can't say anything because they're, they're at will employees. So for those reasons, we wanted to go to an FDO. It's not simply the fact that they picked somebody other than who we were going to pick was the impetus for us to look at it. But that was not the only reason that we went with an FDO. And you mentioned uh, the, the circuit choosing the FPD, which of course is, is the way it's handled. And right. In our circuit, at least, we're asked what our thoughts are. And I think you were contrasting and suggesting that perhaps the judges would have less influence over a federal public defender's office then because the choice would be more insulated than it is seems that like what it you is. meant to say? <clears throat> it seems like it is. The way our CDO worked, and I don't know whether every CDO works that way, the judges have veto power over the panel. You could theoretically take over the panel by just vetoing every time they said, okay, these are the new people we want to veto. Eventually the panel goes off and disappears, so the judges essentially could take it over by the appointment of people that were friendly to their views. That cannot be done with an FDO. With an FDO, the judges, certainly their recommendations are taken into consideration, but the circuit makes the pick. The judges are completely insulated from that. Would you otherwise see the two different types of offices uh, operating in generally the same way with I, this? I would hope that they would. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, again, I had no interest in it when I came. There was a, it was a defender organization. I called it the Federal Defender. It appeared before me. I had no interest in it. 
I heard some complaints along the way. I noticed some, some things myself, but was never overly concerned. But when the, when the opportunity came, when we had these problems that had come along and the opportunity came to pick someone good, I thought we ought to try to do the best that we could do. Thank you. Uh, Judge Scola, I'm interested in the, your, your interest in the panel because I was in the same uh, position. We have a lot of similarities with staggered three-year terms in a panel selection uh, committee and they, they serve at the pleasure of the court, things like that. Um, you do seem to have an embarrassment of riches though in that there, it sounds like there are qualified people who can't get on the panel. It's in some ways a, a closed panel. Um, you, and I'm glad we're hearing from sort of the other side of the, the story, you say that judges are in the best position to review vouchers. Some of the concerns that we've heard uh, from attorneys and others is uh, what about the concept of, of judges learning, especially if they're interim vouchers, about uh, strategy or uh, finding out something. For example, a lawyer wants a certain kind of expert, maybe, maybe to check the purity of the drugs and then that expert doesn't testify, don't you have in the back of your mind then that clearly uh, that expert wasn't going to be helpful or another kind of expert, you don't see them at sentencing. So clearly that didn't work out well. Uh, so that was one concern, and then the other concern is, is there some kind of interorum uh, impact of judges looking at, at vouchers, and is there uh, an involuntary self-cutting self of vouchers because the lawyers don't want to displease judges? Do you have any concerns about that or any sense that that's a concern from the lawyers in your district? Well, in answer to the, the part of the question about whether uh, the judge is going to have some information in his or her mind that's going to later taint them and something else they do in the case. I mean, all the time, they trust us to listen to and perhaps grant the motion to suppress evidence or we suppress evidence so we know the person confessed and then I throw it out as being involuntary. Then <coughs> somehow I'm able to be fair and go forward and make other rulings in the case, whether evidentiary rulings during the trial or sentencing or uh, so. I don't really see that as uh, being a difficult chore for judges. And in terms of our uh, ability uh, to make appropriate decisions, uh, in terms of the vouchers and whether they're accurate and reasonable, I mean, in Fair Labor Standard Act cases, we're required to review uh, the settlements and approve attorney's fees as a, that are part of the settlements. And class action lawsuits, we're required to approve uh, the settlements, including the amount and reasonableness of the attorney's fees. And in contested civil cases, where there's a prevailing party in certain circumstances, we make decisions about the appropriateness of attorney's fees. So it's something that I think we do on a regular basis. Um, I think uh, I've been only here for four and a half years, so I can't give a history uh, before that. Uh, I'm sure uh, my colleague, Judge Graham, has a better sense of the last uh, 20 years before I was here, and I don't know what happens in other parts of the country, but you know, having been the liaison to this committee for the last four and a half years, uh, one of the things that we do, and you know, we're very fortunate that Michael Caruso, our federal defender, does an excellent job, not only with his office, but kind of shepherding uh, the, the CJA panel, and he's the chair of our committee, and he puts on a two-day conference every year, and part of it is education, but part of it is a town hall uh, with several of our judges, uh, and it's kind of an open forum with the, the members of the, uh, the panel. And you know, opening up to those questions, they're not shy about complaining to us about issues. And I think it's, it's not a systemic issue, in, at least in our district, of judges routinely reducing vouchers for no reason whatsoever, uh, or I would hear about it. Um, I think the discovery issues are something that, that, that come up. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't believe uh, that judges in our district are uh, willy-nilly just reducing fees uh, for no reason whatsoever. I mean, when I started, I had five trials that lasted over two months, and I don't. And, I, and in many of those cases, there were other co-defendants that pled out. And I think uh, Mr. Caruso told you that one of the tough things to do is if you did a two-month trial, you were there every day. You know exactly you know, what the case was about and what the lawyers did in the case. 
But if there's a you know five co-defendant case and two of the people had pled guilty before the trial, it's a lot more difficult uh, to discern what they did. But uh, you know, one of the other panelists talked about the trust that we have and we should have trust. And my philosophy is I do trust the lawyers. And if I look at the the vouchers, unless there's some reason, as Judge Graham pointed out, you have another co-defendant in the case with a very diligent lawyer who's uh, voucher was half as much as that lawyer. And again, that, there could be a very good reason why the other lawyer's voucher is twice as much, but it certainly raises a question. And I think uh, in, uh, in our district, a lot of the judges uh, will either bring in the lawyer and talk to him or her and say, look, wh why did you have to go see the client so many times? Okay. And to me, usually the problem is, why didn't you go to see the client more? <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't have all these complaints from the client. Yes. But, you know, whatever the question is, the person can answer, hopefully, to the judge's satisfaction. Um, and a lot of times what the judges do is, if it's a complicated case, they will refer the voucher issue to uh, a magistrate judge. And the magistrate will talk to the attorney and prepare an R&R for the district judge to review. So I've, I think I've there read are many, episodes, many of those yeah, uh, from your district. There are incidents of some complaints, but I don't think it's a systemic problem. Is there, do the I'll judges? Judge, judge Fisher, yeah. can I ask um, Professor sure. Carr, and then we'll move back to you, but um, I, 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 we're gonna run out of time if I don't. Okay, Professor Carr, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, well, first, thank you all for your very helpful testimony. Uh, uh, judge Graham, I wanted to focus on something you'd said that struck me as interesting and helpful, this idea that uh, maybe there should just be more uniform standards, that some of the problems that CJA lawyers have identified are the, the absence of something written down to say exactly what should be compensated, what shouldn't be, what the standards should be. Um, and, and I think that's a promising idea, uh, but then that prompts the next hard question, which is what should those uniform standards be? Uh, and I was hoping members of the panel might be able to help us identify to the extent that is a helpful <coughs> path, sort of saying, here's what should be covered and not should be covered, here's what the standard should be, and the, the role of, of the judge in reviewing voucher requests and the like. What, can you point us towards what you think of as helpful standards um, for the role of the judge in those cases? Sure, I made <coughs> A reference to some of those issues. So obviously the judge should be looking at the complexity of the case. Was it a routine case? Were the legal issues complex? Were there a number of uh, experts which required extra time for the lawyer to be able to get up to par, you know, some areas are very complex and very complicated. Did the case require that type of analysis? Was it a six month trial? Was it a five day trial? Those are some of the considerations that the judges should be looking at in determining how to analyze the voucher. I think some of those things are very uh, typical. It may vary from district to district. So for example, we've talked about lots of documents, maybe in some districts, like a, a border district. I know they have a lot of uh, illegal entry cases. They bring them in, they, they enter pleas primarily, and then deport it, et cetera. Was it that type of case, or was it a different type of case? Those are all issues that the judge has to view and determine if it should be considered as a factor in what's a reasonable amount. And maybe one way of thinking about it just that would help me is what is that ultimate standard? So you mentioned at the end, you know, what, what is a reasonable amount? Should that be, um, should, should judges be trying to say, well, this kind of case deserves X dollars or should it be more this is how much this lawyer actually did work and this was ge genuinely billed. We, we can all agree, for example, that you know, fraudulent billing is bad and that should be cut out. But right. what about the lawyer who says, I'm gonna spend some extra time because I think I have an idea to, and I wanna pursue that. What, do you have a sense of, you know, to the extent there are written standards for whether that should be compensated or well, not, I don't, when should that be compensated? I, I don't think that the amount is an issue because the amounts are national. 
you get 120, what is $129, the amount just went up uh, January 1st, $129 for non-capital cases and a larger amount for capital cases. So judges shouldn't be trying to determine what's the appropriate amount. I think it's the quality of the work, the requirement of the work, how many hours were required to do something. And so that's, you know, is it uh, one lawyer charges double the amount, had legal research for 25 hours, another lawyer had legal research for 50 hours. Why is that? I want to hear from the attorney. I want the attorney to have an opportunity to explain to me. He may have a valid reason for having spent 50 hours. Maybe the group decided that lawyer A should do the legal research on a particular matter. Has a perfectly legitimate reason for having utilized 50 hours. So I think it's just a matter of analyzing the quality of the work. And if anyone else wants to weigh in on those questions. I just think it would be very, very difficult to have national standards. I think it would be too burdensome for the lawyers to figure out where they fit in and for the judge to figure out why this is different. I mean, every case is so different. You can have the most simple case in the world and your client could have <coughs> mental health issues or developmental issues that cause you to, want to have to spend a lot of time talking to them just to explain a simple plea. You could have an incredibly complex case where your client right away says, look, I want to be, like somebody said, to be the first person to beat the other co-defendants to get a plea, to get out of this, you know, with as little uh, trouble as possible, because I know if I wait too long, I only know information against the co-defendant A, and once he pleads, then I am no use to the government. Right? So there's just so many individual factors that I would think would be very difficult to try and establish, and more importantly, to enforce those uh, in reviewing the vouchers. So I don't, I'm not sure that you can in, enforce it, but all of the things that we are talking about, these can be factors that the judge should consider in determining what's an appropriate fee. Yeah, I would, I, I would say that, uh, that you know, it's going to have to be just the experience to do. I know that what we do in our district, or what I do, we know what the average for a particular kind of case is. We have that amount of money. Now, that average goes up as people have found out what the average is, and they know that if they charge close to the average but a little above it, it's probably not going to get called in. If it's above a certain percentage above the average, they get called in and they get asked, explain it. I think most of the time they can explain it. It seems to me to be very reasonable to do that. Somebody has to do it. Uh, I know when I came on the bench, I did not real, I did not remember and did not think about the fact that I would have to review vouchers. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. I can't stand looking at other lawyers' work and trying to decide if their work is worth what they say that it's worth. I hate it. I think I have probably, I can only think of three vouchers that I've reduced. It may, it's certainly going to be five or less. And it was after people were warned that they were consistently above the average and needed to get within line or explain why they were above. And when they couldn't, they were slightly reduced. No big reductions uh, by me. I don't like it. I, I think it would be fine for somebody else to take it on. But it's going to have to be somebody that cares about the taxpayer's money because this is the taxpayer's money. This is money that is being spent for certain things and, and we're not going to be able to take people just at their word if they are not within a certain uh, area of how much they're charging vis-a-vis uh, -vis their peers. Somebody's going to have to do that and it's probably not good to have other lawyers because they're going to have the same problem I have. They're not going to like to look at other lawyers work and cut it. So it's, it's going to be very, very difficult. So it's fine to find somebody. I think Judge Prado has a follow-up. Yes, had, sir. I, I hate to go out of order, but I just had a follow-up question to that. Is, is some, we've heard some complaints about the vouchers take forever and they're cut and we don't know why. What about some regulations that, that would put a time limit on when they have to be done and if it's not done by that time, then it goes through? Or asking the judges to explain why they, they cut them. Instead of asking, when I mean, we can ask the lawyers, explain this to me, but, but some lawyers complain, I, don't, I never found out why my voucher was cut. So if, if there were some regulations that say, the judge should at least explain, this is way over the limit, I, I'm not satisfied with the reasons you gave me, or 
after six months or nine months, that voucher goes through because the judge has sat on it too long. Uh, what about regulations of, of, of that type? I would, I would have no problem with that. I, mean, I think most of, I know, I, if I, I am a clean desk kind of person. If some, a voucher's on my desk for more than two days, that's unusual. Mm -hmm. okay, the only reason you may, I mean, to me, the only legitimate reason why a judge wouldn't do it right away is that maybe there's a co-defendant, he's waiting to get the bill so they can do them all together to do that comparative analysis. But I think in you know, most cases, I mean, it should be easy to do them fairly quickly. And I also wouldn't have a problem with if there was some kind of review above us. Like if you know, the, you say, look, I'm cutting your bill. And again, I've only been here four and a half years, I think I've cut one bill, okay? If, there, if the person disagrees with, you know, with my explanation as to why, then they, I would have no problem with have some other person, whether it's on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal or somebody else, to review it, to give that person some relief. Because I know just from anecdotally that there are, appear to be some judges in other places you know, that just routinely cut bills without explanation. I think that's not fair to, to those lawyers. Best thing to do would be find somebody else to do it, but next to that, your rules, Judge Prado, sound pretty good to me. <laughs> we, we may be unique, I'm not sure, but we have an administrative staff member that reviews all of the vouchers for correctness in terms of amounts and hours, et cetera. They do the, mul the multiplication, et cetera. We receive the voucher with at least the numbers properly done. And I don't think it sits on my desk like Bob for more than a day. I mean, having been a criminal defense lawyer, I understand how important it is to get paid timely. So I think most judges in this district take it very seriously. I don't know if they have to wait in other districts. I don't think that's a problem here. And, and with the e-voucher that's gonna be coming into effect, I mean, I think it was supposed to come into effect by the end of last year, but whenever that comes in, it's gonna be so much easier because you're gonna have it right on your desktop You'll be able to go from the voucher to look at the docket sheet if you have questions. I mean, you're not gonna, it's going to be very easy for the judge to answer his or her questions quickly and to get the bill approved quickly. Got it. Okay. No. Are you done? Yeah. Okay. Dr. Rucker. Let me follow up, if I may, on uh, some of those points, particularly Judge Cogburn, your dissatisfaction with this. Uh, what about an alternative? We've heard a. Uh, a number of things that our other hearings and, and earlier this afternoon too of, of taking this away from the judiciary or at least taking away from the judges. Maybe having something like the federal defenders uh, do the voucher review approval and everything so the judges would not have to be involved in that. I'd like to hear what all three of you judges think about that and also uh, Mr. Ferrer uh, as someone who gets money from outside in a totally different way than uh, what the panel do. Well, I don't know. That, that seems to be a problem for me. How does the federal public defender know what happened in a particular case? The judge is on the front line. He knows what was done. He knows the efforts of the lawyers. He knows the motion practice, et cetera. So it seems to me that someone has to be knowledgeable of the quality and quantity of the work in making that determination. I mean, frankly, most lawyers submit a voucher that's honest and ethical, and it's not a problem, you know? And like Bob, I, I, I've only cut very few, very few, and it's usually when it's in comparison with other work. So how does the public defender or someone else make that determination? That would be pretty difficult. It seems to me it would then just be a ministerial act, and if you want a ministerial act, that's one way of doing it. I'm not sure that's the way it should be approached. And I think Mr. Caruso pointed out a couple of problems with having the federal defender do that review because they, they may have a conflict with the defendant and then now they're making decisions about the payments to the lawyer and also you know, fighting over their budget versus the CJA budget. But even if you found an independent person, like not a judge <coughs> and not the federal defender, okay, there's really not a problem with that person doing it assuming they're qualified. But in a contested voucher, after looking at the case and talking to the lawyer, who's the first person that that independent person is gonna to go to to say, hey, did, did this person really do this or do you think they really deserve it? They're gonna to come to the judges, okay? And say, hey, well, you know, what's, what's going on? There's, this lawyer is you know, charging twice as much as the other three lawyers in the case. You know, is there anything you remember about the case or why? I mean, I can't imagine that we would be completely 
out of the loop. I mean, look, I have enough work to do, as Judge Carver said, if somebody else wants to do it and they're competent and capable, that's fine. I just think at the, that the loop is going to come back to us on those contested matters anyway. Do, do you see a possible conflict uh, or an uncomfortableness, I guess? You don't get to tell the prosecutor who his experts are going to be, yet the judge is asked to pick the defense experts through the voucher system of uh, when there's a request for an expert, the judge gets to review and decide if they're going to approve that expert or not. It, do you see yourself in an uncomfortable position being the, the trier of the case and then deciding who the witnesses might be for a particular side of, of the controversy? I've never felt uncomfortable making that decision. You know, we, we are sworn to uphold the law and be fair and just to both sides. I take that very seriously. And I know lawyers need experts. And I don't have a problem making that determination as we do any other determination. You know, we are the judge. We are the fact finders. We decide what the law is. That's part of our responsibility. I don't know any machine that can do it. I don't know how we could, could change that. Can I, I don't have a problem. I want to follow up to that, um, to Judge Prado's question and your answer then, Judge Graham, because the committee is presented with numbers that indicate that, so for example, I believe in your district and somebody here who's a number person can correct me if I'm wrong, but in your district, um, the panel attorneys use experts in 37% of their cases. Let's use that number. But in other districts, panel attorneys use experts in 1% of their case or in 5% of their cases. That tells us as a committee that there's a difference in the way you may treat the application for an expert than the way they do it in another area of the country. As a committee, who, I mean, I hear what you're saying. I hear what all of you are saying about, you know, we're the best people to judge you know, what a case is about and how much work is put in. But if a judge has that kind of control over whether an expert is used or the decision is made to, and, and they have a different philosophy than you have, what do, what do you suggest is a way to resolve that nationwide? We're not talking about just the Southern District of Florida. We're talking about other judges who may not see it the way you see it. Well, that issue may require further investigation. Is it 1% or 5% because the lawyers are requesting it in 1% of the cases? Or is it the judges are denying the expert in a certain percentage of the cases? So I'm, I'm not Or is really it a cultural where they're afraid to ask because they've been denied so many other times? Well, that would really be scary. I hope that's not the case. But I think that would be a great place where you could have national standards. Because the stand no, because the standard shouldn't be whether the judge thinks this person should testify or not. The standard should be if there's an issue in the case that the defense attorney has identified and wants, and it's, a, it's not a frivolous thing, and wants to hire an expert to advise him or her about that issue, then the judge should approve the, the expertise, as long as it's not, you know, within reason in terms of the expense, somebody who's charging $2,000 an hour or something like that. It's not for us to decide, okay, well, you know, the government has a fingerprint expert. Uh, there's no reason for, you know, everybody knows that the experts don't make mistakes. I'm not giving the defense a fingerprint expert. If they want a fingerprint expert, they should be able to get one. Well, and, and so I guess a follow-up to that is how would we, how, number one, as a committee, how could we possibly determine that? Um, because we don't know why a judge is denying, even when we're talking about vouchers, for example, oftentimes judges won't explain why they're cutting a voucher. They don't have to. They're asked to, but they don't always do it. Or when they deny an expert, we have no data to tell us why they're denying an expert. So how would we possibly... Um, remedy that problem if we if there's no way really to why, know why an expert is being denied maybe the judge would have to if if a defense attorney asks for an expert and the judge denies the request the judge has to articulate with specificity why he or she is not allowing it and then again they have some review process for somebody else 
decide whether or not the, the person should be allowed to hire the expert, even if the judge says no. And there is a review process. If a judge denies a particular expert, it seems to me that's an appealable issue. And it has gone courts. up on appeal and has more recently gone up so, on appeal. Uh, but the standard is a pretty hard, liberal standard. I mean, it's... Right. Right. Is, is it in fact that in the 1% and 5%, is it because judges are denying the right to an expert? Well, we can't. I mean, that's part of what we're trying to determine. I see. I see. So that's, but that's why I'm asking the question. All right. Judge Fisher, do you have any further questions? No, credit? Warren covered my questions for Judge Williams. Okay. No, but you can go ahead because um, we have some time. Okay. Uh, and again, the two of you talked about the selection of your uh, lawyers and the closed uh, system, and first you, you uh, consider all the renewals. Is that creating any kind of problem with an aging panel? We're hearing some issues about that. Everybody, we're, problems with getting new people, are you not having problems with younger people? Well, we, when I first started, we had people were appointed to two year terms, but they were just automatically renewed. There was no, unless you committed <coughs> some act of misconduct and were removed by the judge, you just stayed on the panel forever. So now the system is every year, one third of the panel has to reapply. And, and so we consider them fresh, okay? And we have the committee that's you know, chaired by uh, Mr. Caruso and I think there's 15 lawyers and they make recommendations to the court as to who should be approved. And I think the first year, 11 openings were created, the second year, seven, and this year, five. Okay, and then once those openings are created, then it's open to anybody to apply. And, and we really do uh, make an effort to have uh, more geographical, gender, and racial, and ethnic diversity on the panel. But understanding it's important to have lawyers from Fort Pierce, but I never want to say to some you know, w woman, listen, I know that your son got sentenced to 10 years in prison and the lawyer really wasn't that good, but he was from Fort Pierce, so <laughs> we have to drive that yeah. far. I mean, you know, <coughs> the bottom line is I want the best possible people to, to represent the defendants. Are, are you, have you decided the size of the panel to get them this, a specific number of cases per year to keep them well, actually, up to we, par? The panel is from 1992, I think, or 94, whenever it was formed, was 165 attorneys. And in fact, one of the things that we're considering is that in the northern part of our district, where there are fewer attorneys, and it's harder to get as many you know, really qualified people. Uh, you know, we don't have that issue, but in Miami, in particular, we have uh, so many lawyers on the panel that the lawyers are only getting like one or two cases a year. So we're actually, uh, our court has asked the committee uh, to look at, I think we're having a meeting next month, to look into whether the panel number should be reduced in size. So and that we're, I guess we would just do that by attrition. And you mentioned a number of removals. You said uh, four to eight removals at one point, plus one to three voluntary resignations. What kind of reasons are there for the removals, and are you providing those to the lawyers, or you just say well, the it's at who will and no? apply and don't get admitted. That there's no reason. It's like if you apply to be a, a magistrate judge, you don't come out of committee. Nobody sits down and explains to you right. why. But the people who are removed, we have a a. a conduct review panel that consists of uh, Judge Cook and myself, and together in consultation with Michael Caruso, the federal defender, uh, we uh, will notify the person, look, there's a specific complaint about you for this. We're, uh, if you would like to come in we're, and meet with us on a particular date, you come and explain uh, what your uh, response to that is. And uh, so we have those hearings. And if Judge Cook and I decide uh, what the proper remedy should be, whether to not find any discipline or to suspend them or remove them, then uh, if we both agree on that after consulting with Mr. Caruso, then that's the end of it. If we don't agree, uh, then the chief judge makes the, the final decision. Sometimes these problems emanate from alcohol or drug abuse or other issues like that. Right, Sometimes the defendant I can we'll remember in particular, brought it to the court's attention. And we investigated it, and that attorney was removed. It was a case that Judge Graham had where the person's lawyer had not never gone to see the defendant or saw him one time. And the family was in court saying, look, the lawyer doesn't go. And the lawyer's explanation was, 
believe it or not. This case is a hopeless case. So there's really nothing I could talk to the defendant about. So I'm just like doing legal work to try and see if there's something I can do. I'm like, that's a hopeless case. He's looking at a mandatory life sentence. That's when you should go to jail more often to, yes. to like get him ready for the bad news. And unfortunately, in that particular case, the attorney was arrested for drug usage soon thereafter. So those things happen, unfortunately. I believe Professor Carr has a question. Thank you. I, I, at, the, at the risk of repetition, I wanted to go back to something that I, I maybe I'm just stuck on this point, but let me, let me try, try it again, which is in, in trying to figure out what the standard perhaps should be for review of either vouchers or requests for experts. You know, one, one answer is that it should be some sort of general reasonableness um, answer, although as a, as a law professor, I know with my students, you can see the first year students within about a month of law school, they realized that the easiest way to answer any legal question is to say that it should be a reasonable standard, because then that, that sort of means that the answer will be filled in later. And so, so, so I'm wondering, you know, are there other ways of, of doing it that you think might be, might be better? So one, one might be, for example, to say that, you know, as long as uh, a defense, a, a CJA lawyer build that time in good faith, um, subject to some cap as to the number of hours a higher cap than the, I think, fairly low cap that we currently have as a statutory matter, that that's what the review should be for? Or maybe, um, you know, as long as the judge is persuaded that the CJA lawyer was not intentionally delaying and sort of just padding the bills by saying, you know, I'm going to fiddle with fonts for five hours on this memo just to add more time and therefore more money. You know, what, I, I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is, you know, what's the ultimate standard that we should want judges to apply? Because um, I think a lot of the disagreement and a lot of the uh, uncertainty and, um, and concerns from the, the CJA lawyers is, is not the, the inability to know what the standard is and concerns that that standard is too subjective and, and different judges reviewing them in different ways. Well, at the risk of answering the question the same way, <laughs> Whether it's good faith or reasonableness, I'm not sure that that is the crucial factor. Sure, it has to be in good faith. Sure, it has to be reasonable. But it seems to me that what you should concentrate on is what are those factors, what are those points that the judge should consider in determining good faith or reasonableness. So there can't, there's not just one standard that covers every scenario. It, it is a general good faith or reasonableness, but you should consider complexity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in making that determination. I mean, honestly, what we should be, we shouldn't be looking at the number, whether it's 12,000 or 6,000, saying, well, that sounds reasonable, or it's not. If you're going to review the, the voucher, you look at the underlying hours, OK? And you say, wait, this person said they did. Yeah. 17 hours on legal research and writing. Okay, let me look at the docket sheet and let me see what motions were filed on their behalf. Now, there could be 17 hours resulting in no motions because they reviewed a motion to dismiss issue and decided not to file one. But that's something that might raise a question in your mind. Or I went to see the person you know, 17 times in, in, in jail, and that, again, that would raise a question, but it's not the end of it. So if you look at the individual entries on the case, Okay, and each one of them appears to be reasonable. That should be the end. The fact that it adds up to six thousand or sixty thousand shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the only way I can look at it. Okay, Mr. Farah, uh, we've heard testimony this morning that that uh, sequestration uh, maybe targeted public defenders or CJA, or that they were adversely affected. I don't know if you can tell us or not, but, but how was your office affected by sequestration? The biggest effect that we have was uh, resources of AUSAs, assistant U.S. attorneys and professional staff members in our office. We were in a hiring freeze uh, for a very long time. Uh, so if we lost a lot of prosecutors, we were not able to backfill and, and fill those uh, positions until later. Uh, sequestration also affected us by the fact that uh, we had less money to deal with our litigation expenses and we had to, um, uh, there were instances in the office where we had to uh, remind ourselves to continue to recycle every <laughs> 
bit of, uh, whether it were red wells or notebooks or whatnot. I mean, it affected us in the very sort of day-to-day -day operation sense. Uh, we were, though, uh, very lucky that um, our particular office and, and the U.S. Attorney's offices in general did not have to have uh, furloughs like some of the agencies had. But some of the agencies did suffer um, from furloughs, which meant uh, it was more drain on resources for them. and. Um, it, so that that was sort of kind of effect that we have on that we had because of sequestration. Okay, and, and let me ask the judges. As a result of sequestration, do you feel like you got any directives from from the AO about how to treat vouchers because of the budget situation or, or how to cost containment with regard to to public defenders? Did you did you feel like you got any type of restrictions of any type that told you to be careful, look at it, vouchers more carefully, or anything of that type? I never received any instructions or directives in that regard. I, I agree. No. Dr. Walker, any questions? Right, uh, one more question about uh, e-discovery, if I can. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, the massive amounts of e-discovery that are taking place now. We're talking about many terabytes of data being dumped on are not dumped, but given over. I shouldn't so sorry about that. <laughs> that old term, archaic. Uh, but but one of the concerns that I have about that is the um, the technology is changing so rapidly now that uh, the data are not always in the same format. And we've heard panel attorneys complain that they they can't access it, or or if it's provided even in PDFs, it's like each document is a PDF, and they all have to be open, and it's time consuming to do things like that. Do you feel that the resources are there for the panel attorney to be trained to handle this or that they can uh, hire the paralegals and other people that they need to access and go through this uh, data? I've, I've never noticed that to be the problem. It's usually a technical problem. The way the disk is formatted on one computer, it doesn't work on another computer. The fact that the paralegals and the attorneys can view it and intelligently <coughs> decipher it once they're able to access it, I haven't seen that as a problem. I think whatever your judicial philosophy is, no judge wants to have people spend money unnecessarily. And, you know, and I think I mentioned at our town hall, a lot of people complain about, oh, so the government just gives you, sometimes not a, not a, a thumb drive, they just give you a hard drive. Now here, here's everything on this hard drive. Now you figure out how to connect it to your computer and figure things out. And I, what are we supposed to do? And, you know, and I'm sure if they say, look, I want to hire a forensic expert to open up this and figure out a way to format to my computer. I mean, no, I don't want to have the taxpayers pay all that money. And I don't think any judge does. And I think, you know, and to me, if they came in front of me, I would sit down with a prosecutor and say, figure out a way, look, you have to have this information in a format to work in my courtroom. Okay, with these computers. So you have the ability to get it in a format that it's usable by other people besides whatever uh, agency is or your office. So get it to this attorney in the same format so they're not gonna spend thousands of hours and have to hire forensic experts just to get to the information. And you know, the same thing with giving three terabytes of discovery without identifying you know, what's there in a very detailed way. And you know, even if the government does give you a detailed index, and even if they say, look, these are the hot documents or these are the documents we're gonna use, you know, that fulfills their obligation to tell you what they're gonna use that helps their case. But they can also say, oh, by the way, in that three terabytes are all the Brady and Giglio materials as well. And I, mean, I think they have an obligation also to identify with some specificity that information as well. But I'm, I've never had one case where one lawyer has come to me and said, Judge, please tell me, give me help to get this information in a better format, other than people griping at this town hall. And my answer to them was, well, go to the judges, and I, I hope they've been doing that. Yeah. I agree with uh, Bob. This may be a credit to the U.S. Attorney, but we really don't have a lot of problems with that issue in this district. Uh, yeah, it's a, but it's a challenge. They, they like work said, together. The, there are problems, but the parties work together at solving the problem, I think. And of course, you know, there, there are defense lawyers here who might have a different answer. I don't yeah. know. Defense lawyers but are always going to have to have a healthy, a healthy <laughs> suspicion when the government tells you it's right here, that really it's going to be over here. Right. I mean, they're always going to have a healthy suspicion about that. 
So this this whole idea of terabytes is is of, of data is creating a real problem in terms of that. I know I've got a, a case that's uh, that could be a capital case right now. It's being considered by the department, and there's there's material on there, and they've gotten together and gotten a, a specialist to deal with the documents and things like that. Some of the other things to put together. They've got one person that handles discovery, so. There's going to have to be all sorts of things that are thought about of what to do about uh, these cases with, with lots and lots of documents that are on, on these disks that are creating a real problem because um, the government may be honestly telling you all of these things, but as a defense attorney, you, there's other stuff that you're interested in other than what the government's doing. I know I noticed on these things that all these panels, the one in Santa Fe and the one here, has got defense attorneys on one and judges are on he all on here with the U.S. attorneys. Now, we, we like U.S. attorneys, but we like defense attorneys too, and judges are not part of the U.S. attorney's office. We may be put on these panels for whatever reason with, with U.S. attorneys, but we are, we're, we're, we are the n one neutral in the courtroom. We are the one neutral party in the courtroom. Judge Fisher, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to the committee and we'll allow committee members. I have a question for Judge Cogburn. Yes, ma'am. Judge, I'm glad that you were willing to come here today and talk about the situation in your district. You had mentioned that the reason that the judges of your district were concerned with FDO versus a CDO and wanting to pursue an FPD, I'm sorry, an FPD office, FDO office, versus a uh, community defender, was because you felt like you weren't getting enough applicants. And I know that you said kind words about the, the fine North Carolinian gentlemen who are in the other districts in North Carolina, Mr. Small and Mr. McNamara. And Mr. Allen, Lewis Allen. From, uh, and Mr. Allen. Yes. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Small, I believe, is a South Carolinian. He is, but he's also... Sorry, I'm not from the South, notch, as you probably guessed. Top notch anyway, federal... Um, I know that you said very nice things about them. Both of those gentlemen have been the defenders for over a decade, closer to two. So it's been quite some time since there was a search in their districts. My question to you is, when you and your colleagues were making this decision and thinking about the fact that you wanted to have a, a larger pool. Did you go to other districts or did you go to Defender Services and get information about the difference between how many people apply for FPD jobs, Federal Defender jobs, versus a Community Defender job? Did you we, do that research? We did not. All right. But my understanding is that the person that the, the judges recommended for this position, for the federal defender position, I'm sorry, for the community defender position, was an assistant federal defender who had been let go during the sequestration period. Is that correct? That is correct. And that one, you or one of your colleagues, I'm not sure who, then hired that person to be your law clerk. One of my colleagues. All right. So that person was a judge's law clerk when the court recommended that person for the federal defender position, that is correct? True. Right. That is true. So Judge, I'm sure you can see that when the board chose someone else, you can see that folks would look at this and see, if nothing else, something that we're always concerned about as lawyers and judges is the appearance of impropriety. That's not what the, the head of the, of the board told us. The reason that they hired her was they liked her. She had been there before, so they decided to leave her there. All right. That was, why, that was the reason they gave. They never mentioned impropriety at all. I'm not asking Now, that may have come from, from Ms. Clark uh, up, in the, up in the defender's office, but it didn't come from those folks at all. All right, let's go back to that then. So you said that the reason that they chose her is because they liked her, correct? So assuming they would say something more professional like they thought that that selection would be a good choice and would be a good job, do a good job for the office. Fair to say? I don't know. I don't know. They didn't say that. 
They said they liked her, and so they chose her. They said they, they said that they liked her. She'd been there for a while, and they were gonna they were gonna keep her, keep her there. They understood how the judges felt, and it was it was it was very very odd to the judges, because although Mr. Cochran had been hired by one of the judges, and judges pretty much know this, we don't have any great love for the law clerks of the other judges. We don't have any any close associations with those law clerks necessarily. This person had given their life to federal defense, had transferred to, to the district for whatever reason that he transferred, and was let go in what I think was very odd in that he was the most experienced person in the office by the person who ultimately was fired from that position during an embezzlement. I think he'd had some criticism according to what we understand of the office and the internal workings of the office under the leadership of the person that came before Ms. Richardson came. And he was, uh, he was fired uh, by that person. Some of the defenders offered, could not believe that and offered to take cuts in pay uh, over this firing and said, we, you don't have to fire him, we'll take less money, leave him there. But he was taken off. It had nothing to do uh, with, with his qualifications. We don't know why he was let go by that district. But he had trial experience. He had lots of experience as a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a defender. We saw him to be actually qualified to do it under the fe guidelines of federal defender. Ms. Richardson would not have qualified for the job. They selected her, but she would not have qualified for the job. We wanted to change and add, we asked for help from the defender organization in Washington. But the defender organization was more busy with defending a CDO over an FDO than it was in helping us. We got no help. We want, there's been a lot of talk about transparency, and I, want, and I don't know that today is the day to get into all of this, but there was no transparency from the Defender Organization in Washington. We got, we were uh, stonewalled. We got as much transparency as a brick wall from them in what we were trying to do. We met nothing but resistance. They, would, they sent people down to talk to us, and when they left, they wouldn't talk to us about anything they were saying. They wanted to get information from us. Then they went and met with the defender, the community defender, and the defender board. So if you want to talk about independence, they were certainly not working for the administrative office of the courts when they were doing that. They were working for the defender organization when they were doing it. What should have been, in my opinion, what they were worried about was the quality of representation in our district and not under what format that it was. We don't want to pick who the defender is. They can pick anybody that they want to at the circuit level. But whoever we have will be a, will be a federal defender organization with federal employees, without any problems, with conflict of interest, and no chance to embezzle funds. Well, I understand what you're saying, sir, but ultimately what I hear you saying is that the court chose, in their mind, a better candidate that the, than the defender board, than the community defender board. The court chose a better candidate. The community defender board chose a candidate that was not acceptable to the court. There and so the court, excuse me, sir, and so the court decided that it was now time to change the organization <clears throat> and to take the steps necessary to change the organization. Would that be a fair summary of what you just said? Not be a complete summary of what I've said. I understand that that is what you, the position that you wish to take with regard to that. And obviously you have a lot of information about it. But what we did was we had a, a, a period of time where there had been dissatisfaction among the judges with the defender organization, which we thought with the change of the defender was going to bring about real change. We were surprised, we were surprised at the lack of, of candidates for the job and that probably the, probably, um, the only qualified candidate under federal defender rules was uh, Cochran. We were surprised at that. We were really surprised, certainly, that he was not chosen and we thought that we were going to get more of the same from the Federal Defender Organization, which was an unsatisfactory representation. 
uh, uh, for, uh, for our district. I have been asking Ms. Richardson since she came on to let me run something like they run at the NAC for the US, assistant U.S. attorneys, for the panel attorneys, that I would be glad to, to, to sit as a judge and do moot court to try to train some of these folks to be better lawyers. But instead of doing that, and she kept saying, that's a great idea, we're going to do it. Nothing happened. We have some good lawyers on the panel, and we have some that aren't good. I don't know that we've cut any off the, off the panel, but I have to make motions for variances sui sponte sometimes that lawyers should be making. And they might make those if they were better trained and better lawyers. But and I have are... to do it. We felt like we needed a change. And I think the, and I think the judges are entitled to the format that they want to have. The control of it is within, the, is within the defender. But if I understand you correctly, those are CJA lawyers, not lawyers that are, con not lawyers that are hired or employed by the community defender, there correct? Are, but there are lawyers on there that are still not strong. She has chosen as her first assistant a lawyer that could not be a panel attorney. He's not qualified. He second chaired one criminal case. Her top, top gun in the Asheville office is her um, appellate chief, who has never been in the courtroom. The trial attorneys are chafing because they were not selected for these higher positions. She has shown a bad judgment in selecting people to run, to run her office as well as other things. It's a, it is a mess. We need a change. We need somebody new. Judge Cogburn, can I ask a, yes, a, a follow-up question? Um, yes, and that is, my understanding of the way the CDO worked in uh, your district was essentially that there was a um, uh, a uh, committee that oversaw, like a board of directors that oversaw that, whatever her name is, Miss Richardson or whatever. Um, there was a, a board of directors that would have been appointed by the judges um, and then they oversaw that CDO office. Is that correct? That's correct. Originally they were appointed by the judges and then they, they select their own new members. But, but the then judges you have veto, veto power. Okay. So when all of it, how long would you say, um, in your opinion, there were problems in that CDO office? Since the director before the director now was there. So how many years would you say? Well, I don't know. I've only been there, um, I would say probably since, since 11. Is all I can talk about. 2011 is all okay. I can talk about. Okay, and so when those judges, when those problems were developing, and you know the judges had a concern about representation, did do they meet with the board that oversees the CDO to say, you know, board of directors, you know, I have a concern about, or we have a concern about the way the CDO is functioning. Judge Conrad, when he was the chief judge, uh, met some, and I think Judge Whitney met when he became the chief, met some. I directly did not. I did talk to Ms. Richardson, okay. but I did, not, I did not talk to the board. Okay. I, I pretty much stayed out of, out of things because I didn't want to get lawyers in trouble. I didn't want anybody to lose their job. Uh, I just wanted people to be represented. Okay. And I do not understand, I do not understand, other than the fact that we walked into the middle of this, why there is such a fight over whether it's an FDO or a CDO. I really do not understand that because we have control of neither and don't want it. I don't want control of that. I don't want control of the vouchers. I want to do my job and I want them to do their job. But we have been wrongly accused and, and we're not happy about that at all. All we want are, is representation. We think we need better representation in our district. I note in here that there are lawyers that apparently say that they're worried if their vouchers are cut, that, that that's what they're worried about when they don't get in the face of a judge. Well, I think two things about that. Number one, I never thought when I was a defense attorney that getting in the face of the judge was a good strategy for my client. Uh, and so I don't know that I ever got in the face of a judge and. And, uh, and did anything that was, was going to cause my client a problem. I also re can re think that my fee and whether the judge was going to cut it was not within my, anywhere in my mind, anywhere in my mind, when I was representing my client. I worried if I made the judge mad that my client might get hurt. 
I worried if I made the judge mad that the U.S. government might be badly served if I did it when I was on that side. I never was worried about anything like that, about a fee. I think if lawyers are worried about their fee when they're representing a client, we need different lawyers. Yes, Judge Wall. Uh, based upon what uh, the three of you have said, it doesn't appear that uh, voucher cutting is a problem with you. And from what I hear from the judges from this district, it's not a problem in this district. But we have heard uh, from others that it is a problem, and some say a significant problem. Uh, judges don't like to be told that they have to do anything. But uh, should we, because there is a problem, if we determine that there is, uh, require, or at least recommend to the judicial conference that they require it. If you're going to cut a voucher, you have to articulate why you're going to cut them. And if you're not prepared to articulate why in writing you're not, uh, you're going to cut a voucher, that the voucher can't be cut. I have no problem with that. I have no problem. I don't either. When, you, when you're doing an attorney's fee order in a civil case, you have to set forth, like, these are the number of hours, these are the a reasonable rate and, and you're giving an explanation it's something that we do anyway so there's no reason why we shouldn't do it in those cases too and we actually do that now if I call an attorney in to discuss it when I make the final decision I let him know why so I don't have a problem with someone else taking a look at that and making it a final decision. All right. anybody else First, let me thank everybody for being here, and especially you, Judge Cogburn, coming down with pneumonia. I do have some questions for you, and you'll pardon me if I don't shake your hand afterwards. Um, I do have some That's questions for forgiven. you about the conversion, and uh, let me start by asking you, I I've heard you talk about problems that you saw with management of the Federal Defender Organization, the Community Defender Organization. I haven't heard you talk about problems with the quality of representation. Did those exist also in your mind? You're talking about panel or attorneys? No, no the attorneys at the Federal Defender. There were, there were some, but there were some we, there were weaker, weaker, can, weaker folks than, in, uh, than some. Some are strong, some are weak. But it's that way in everything. It's that way in the U.S. Attorney's Office. There are strong prosecutors and there are weak prosecutors. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say there are no, certainly no incompetent Federal Defenders at all. You talked about uh, not being able to get help from the administrative office in this process, and I want to ask you some questions about that. Did you ask for help in determining what were the potential benefits of a federal defender office versus a community defender office? We, we, uh, I think we knew what those, what those were okay. generally and discussed those and, and came to the conclusion on a couple of others, but no. But well, we, we received immediate feedback that that was not something that needed to be done from the office, or Judge Whitney uh, received immediate feedback that that was a problem. And we have been fought tooth and nail since then. We, they came up with an amount of money, which they originally said was going to be very costly to do a conversion, when most of that money was, was retirement benefits, vacation, and things that were already accrued and really were not part of the conversion. The convert they, now, they now admit that their money is not a problem with the well, conversion. L let, me, let me delve a little bit further into this because, and, and I'll tell you a little bit of my background so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I am the head of a community defender organization and for 10 years before that and I was the chief assistant of the federal public defender organization here in Miami and for three or four years before that an assistant federal public defender in the same district um, and before that a state public defender. So I think I know probably as well as just about anyone the differences between community defender organizations and federal public defender organizations in real on the ground terms. And, you know, we can talk about this afterwards rather than wasting time, but I, but I disagree with some of the differences that you felt exist. And so that's why I'm asking the question and, and about some, whether and or not some they provided disagree. that information. Uh, and I agree. Some districts may have, di have community defender organizations that they love, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Okay. But, but some may not, but some don't. And, the, and the, the main thing we need to be worried about is, are the defendants being represented? It's not whether somebody is listed at the head of a letterhead or not. It's are the defendants being rightfully represented 
And that's the main thing. Well, I, I agree with you, but there's a couple components that go into that. And if you're going to, so one of the first ones is you asked a question a minute ago about you didn't understand why there was such angst over this changeover. And let me, I'll, I'll tell you my view, and, and then I've got a follow up question to understand, which is that from the point of view of defense attorneys, we see it as an attack upon the independence of the defense function which we value highly, which I know judges value highly. You've said you value it, all the judges here have said they do. And so that being the case, it concerns us when a change is made with what we don't believe is a good reason. And so that's why I'm trying to follow up to understand some of these things. And, and I guess what I'd like to know is what information, did, did the district seek from anyone else other than the administrative office information about the differences between federal defender organizations, federal public defender organizations, and community defender organizations. I don't know who all the judges talked to. There was some discussions made. Judge Conrad's been very interested in this for a long time. Judge Whitney uh, may have made some, but there were, there were num numerous discussions between the judges about the problems and the benefits of making the change. Mm -hmm. You and I can be here for all night and we won't agree with this. Yeah, no, I'm, and I'm but not the, but the agreement, and, just... and I'm not saying that we were right or that we were wrong, but it was the best call we could make at the time. And we are all interested, one after another, in the defense function being done properly. Mm -hmm. And we're not interested in, in doing any damage to anything. In fact, if this, I probably wouldn't be here if, if not for this uh, fight that they wanted to make about us wanting to change what is going on. And we wouldn't even be a part of, uh, of this question. All I'm saying is that, there, that we were wrongly treated in the way that that played out as to why we moved it. And as they say, if the, as I've, I've made this argument before, if the truth will set you free, then tell the truth. If the truth is that we, picked, that we made that pick, then why did they have to tell the story that it was a one-year law clerk? That, that is wrong, 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 and, it's been, and was told as late as Sand, Santa Fe. Well, and I've got, and I've got the, and they, I can give the name of the person it was told to. Well, Judge, I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a member of the Defender Services Advisory Group as well as very a, a number of other committees that. Uh, that uh, function as part of the defender governance structure. And so I think I'm pretty cued in to what goes on in the defender offices and what even what rumors are floating around. And I have to tell you, while I've been told over and over again that the judges were unhappy that a law clerk, a present law clerk of a judge wasn't selected as the head of the office, I've always heard this individual described as a prior federal defender in two different districts and have never heard the individual described as a one-year lawyer. It was just done in Santa Fe to a specific defender who is glad to be, unlike a lot of other people who do, don't want to be identified, uh, who have who spoken to me, who fear uh, the, the, their uh, slots being taken away. A person was in the room when that rumor was allowed to leave the room. And that right. person does not want to be identified because they fear defender slots being taken away as revenge. So that, that, that lie was told, and that lie was told again as recent as Santa Fe. And I have the person specific, their name, that uh, does not mind being identified as to who that lie was told to. Well, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to him because I was in Santa Fe and never heard any such statement made by anybody. Can so. I clarify something about, and then uh, I think uh, Mr. McBride has a question. Uh, Judge Cogburn, are you saying, I know that when we were there for our public hearing, um, there was also a separate function going on? Yes. Okay. It, it was are at you, the separate function. It wasn't at our public no, hearing. No, this person was teaching this person was teaching okay. at, defender, at the defender, baby defender school. Okay, because That's I, I want to make it perfectly school. clear and, and make sure we're clear that this committee operates on facts, not rumors. And we question, and like you've seen here, because you're getting a, a bit of a, a, a questioning, we're doing it because we want facts. We don't want rumors. And so when uh, I want to clarify for the public that I didn't hear anybody say anything about one year. And so you're saying if that separate 
meeting or whatever that was it was. At the, that was at Baby Defender School. Yes, okay. it was. Okay. Baby Defender School. All right. So Mr. Just, can I ask one last question? Because sure. I just want to correct one thing that I think we probably can come to an agreement on, which is you talked about job protections for FDO staff as compared to CDO staff. And the judiciary's policy is that all federal public defender employees are at will and are entitled to no civil service protection. So can we agree that that doesn't differ from community defender organizations? That doesn't differ, but there are, there are protections you can go through as a federal employee in terms of being able to, to work, to be able to, uh, if you're fired, use that you don't have with the other. <coughs> We, we, we can agree, because, we'll agree with that. Can, can, can you tell me what those are? Because I'm unaware of any I can't such. right this minute, no. Okay, Mr. McBride. Thanks, Judge. I, I was going to uh, move to a different talk, topic, if that's, that's okay. Fine. Um, a question for uh, the United States Attorney, um, Mr. Ferrer. Uh, one, one of the issues that uh, is on the agenda for today, we've talked a little bit about it, but I, I'd love your um, thoughts, and that's. Um, uh, the department's uh, increasing pursuit of extraterritorial uh, investigations and prosecutions and the impact on sort of the intersection between um, extraterritorial discovery and resources, particularly for, for CJA panel attorneys who may um, be asked to uh, defend those, those cases. Your office obviously has been a, uh, a real leader in, in um, extraterritorial cases starting with you know, the, the um, counter-narcotics work in Columbia, you know, some years ago, but, but you guys really uh, span the globe and, as I understand it, have cases on, you know, dozens of countries, multiple continents. Um, my understanding is that the, the Southern District, uh, like my old district, often looks to the federal defender a, as sort of the first in line if, if there's a, um, uh, a, a defendant who's, who's being brought back for uh, prosecution in your district. But in multi-defendant cases, obviously, then CJA or other attorneys would be asked to, to come in. Um, and just curious, in your experience, if, if you have um, thoughts on whether as, as DOJ is, is looking to uh, detect and disrupt and mitigate threats on the far sides of the globe before those threats come um, here to, uh, to, to U.S. shores, whether um, you know, the AO and uh, the appropriators who fund the public defenders and the CGA um, panel need to uh, step up funding uh, to provide uh, resources for um, whether it's discovery or, you know, going abroad to do investigations, whether in Columbia or the Middle East or uh, so forth. We'd just love your thoughts on that, that topic. Sure. No, happy to. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, we are seeing an increase in a lot of our international work, uh, just as you said. Um, there's a lot of uh, different statutes, long, uh, the, the long arm statutes that we're using more effectively now, and even in human trafficking is one instance, for example, that we are doing that in addition to the narcotics work. That, those schemes, which seem to be elaborate, um, involve witnesses from all over the world, will necessarily involve increased costs and a need for more resources. You have the issue of translations, uh, foreign speak, uh, language speakers, uh, that's going to always incur extra costs and, and more resources. That is the scenario that you described, Mr. McBride. It's exactly what we see here. Uh, the federal public defenders and the CGA attorneys who are very strong and very good uh, working together on a lot of these cases. There's a lot of expenses. Um, we work it out with the, with the judges and figuring out uh, how to deal with those expenses. Um, we have you know, Rule 15 in the criminal, uh, the, uh, criminal procedure which says that you know, now really depending on, it doesn't even matter so much anymore about who's making the request for a deposition overseas, um, these issues are gonna come before the judges in figuring out how we share those costs. Um, and uh, so that's a, a big challenge that we are absolutely seeing. It's, not gonna, it's only gonna increase. Uh, the complexities of these cases are gonna increase. The world is getting smaller, um, especially in the area of cybercrime. Um, we are seeing now that someone sitting in the kitchen in a foreign country could cause havoc anywhere in the United States. And the more that we see in that, and the more that we, and we as we should, be more aggressive in making sure that that is not 
permissible and, and being uh, accounted for, it's going to it's going to require more resources. So, right now, I will say that we are we are fortunate that these issues uh, are getting resolved, but the more expensive it's going to get, and um, and if we unfortunately uh, ha ever have a situation like sequestration, again, that's only going to make things worse. So, I, I our I always feel that in these kinds of cases, the more that we can get in terms of resources on both sides, uh, it can only benefit our efforts. Um, Chip has a question. Mr. Frenzley. Oh, thank you. Uh, you were speaking earlier to the judges about the role and to a certain extent the rationale behind the judge's role in voucher reviewing and that rationale being that they're the ones who are overseeing the case and see what's going on in the cases. And I'm just curious, to the extent that so much of the time I would safely say a majority of the time that submitted vouchering is out of court time, not time in front of the judges. Uh, do you think that rationale still holds true um, with respect to voucher review and that the judges would be in a better position than someone who's not involved in the case on a day-to-day -day basis in reviewing that primarily out of court time where you really don't know what's happening? And, and secondly, as a sort of a continuation of that, what do you think about that rationale with respect to the review of excess vouchers at the circuit level where it goes to some circuit judge or designee who really wouldn't have any involvement in the case? I don't think I said it was my rationale was that I'm basing it on what happens in front of me. I think, I just think we are as capable as anybody else. We do it all the time in other cases. Uh, so I think we're equipped to do it. Uh, if some other independent person did it, they would have zero information about the case. Okay, we, you know, every single criminal case, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, the vast majority of criminal cases don't disappear by the most of the <coughs> They either go to trial, so you see it, or the guy takes a plea, or the woman takes a plea, and you see it. And you're there for the plea color, you're there for the sentencing, you know what the factual basis is, you have arguments about mitigation, so you, I mean, every single criminal case that's not dismissed by the government on its own motion, you are seeing a lot of things that are happening. So again, you're not seeing everything, but you have some sense, and you certainly have more sense than some other person who has nothing to do with the case. It's complicated. It's a, it's a mess. I mean, uh, you and I don't want the judges doing this. Uh, you'd rather have somebody else do it, but who else does it? It's got to be somebody that knows what's being done. It's got to be somebody that understands the work that needs to be done. So that's lawyers. Well, if it's defense lawyers, that creates another issue of one defense lawyer looking at another defense lawyer's work. And uh, how are we going to get that done? And the taxpayer has to be protected all the way along the way so that the money is not uh, misspent. I'll agree, defenders do a great job of, of at, this, at the present time of doing their job, but what happens when, when you know it's it's candy time and, and every every voucher is being being uh, uh, signed? What do you do when July gets in? There's no money. You come to the judges and say, "Turn everybody loose. We have constitutional violations. We can't represent these folks anymore." So it's a complicated situation. It's not an easy situation. I sympathize very much with it. I don't want to do it. Find someone else to do it that can do it, and it's not going to be conflicted by it, and I'd be very, very happy about it. But it's got to be somebody that has a taxpayer in mind. I believe Judge Walton has a question. Mr. Ferrer, you indicated <clears throat> that you receive, as all U.S. Attorney's Office, receive a certain amount of money for a fiscal year. But if you run out of money or if you need certain services beyond that amount, that you can petition DOJ to get those, that funding. Do you know of any situation where your office has done that and it's been denied, or any other office that's made that request and it's been denied? It's, uh, I don't know about other offices. Uh, we have, uh, during sequestration, for example, there were situations where we had to ask uh, for big case litigation expenses uh, type of cost. Uh, but it wasn't very frequent, I, I got to tell you. In my five and a half years, we might have asked maybe once or twice. Uh, so it's not something that, because it's not something that is really... Uh, for an extra large office that has uh, more of a bigger budget than smaller offices, uh, I guess we're fortunate in that sense that we have, uh, you know, a budget that allows us to do our job. Uh, smaller districts, I will tell you, they have a real challenge because, as I said before, that when we get our budget, even though depending on the number may sound like a large number, 90% usually is for salaries, it's personnel. 
So if a smaller district uh, has a much smaller you know, range in, in terms of their, of their litigation expenses, they, that can be wiped out if they've got a couple of real large cases that they weren't foreseeing. And though I, more of those districts, I can see them asking DOJ for, for help. Um, we in the Southern District of Florida haven't had to do that very often at all. But it is a reality, and, and as Mr. McBride was telling us, you know, I was thinking about his question and about how, more, how complicated these extraterritorial cases are getting. Um, in human trafficking, there are situations where in order to even find the witness is a real expense, you know, going into and finding uh, victims in, in, in jungles, I mean, in, in real remote areas. Um, when you talk about lodging and uh, travel expenses, that's, that's up in, in the increase. It's, it's increasing now. But so, so what do you feel about the perception of at least some of the defense bar that the playing field when it comes to resources is unequal? Oh, well, I, I mean, like I said, we, we get a certain amount of money, and uh, a lot of the offices run out. Uh, again, from the extra large office, uh, extra large districts, I just haven't had, you know, we've, we've had situations where, you know, we're running up against, you know, against the, on the line. So we're the fortunate ones, I think. That's why perhaps in this district, we haven't seen uh, too many issues, especially when I canvassed the office and asked them if they knew of situations where experts were not being used in certain cases because of a lack of funding. Um, and they did not see that. But I don't think that's the case uh, in every part of the, of the country. Um, and, and that's, uh, I'm sure that's something that you, I'm sure all of you are looking at and asking, but uh, I, I would venture to say that in the smaller and mid-sized offices, you may get a different answer. Mr. Farrar, can I ask sort of a follow-up? So when um, your office uses experts um, in, in a case, and you, the, you know, the CJA attorneys are out trying to decide if they're gonna get experts, but when you use experts, do you actually go out and find experts and pay experts, or do you have sort of in-house experts because you have the FBI and you have the you know, a Homeland Security? How, how does that work for your office? It, it's a mix, it's okay. a mix. Uh, we do have uh, experts that are agents, uh, some of them who are former agents that can come in and have been qualified uh, as, as being experts. Uh, that's the but does it, it doesn't always come out of your budget then does it come out of your yes, budget? it will come out it comes out of our budget it comes so, out of so so if if you're doing an FBI case do you have to take the money out of your budget to have an FBI expert no. oh well and that oh, okay no no and that and that's in that case uh, not necessarily but we use a lot of you know either retired uh, agents um, if they are local uh, police officers who are coming in as experts we pay that from our our budget so anything that's outside of DOJ, you know, okay. without, outside of the United States Attorney's Office. Okay. Can I ask Mr. Ferreira a quick follow-up? Um, there was something you said earlier, and you were talking about the increasing ca cost of cases, you know, and we've all seen it. We all see how discovery increase and everything. But I, I wasn't aware of how your budgeting worked until you explained it. So you, now that I know that, I know you've, you've got a certain amount of money and you know how many indictments you bring in a given year. Are you able to give us any rough sense of the rate of increase year to year on the cost of prosecution? Like, is it increasing 5% a year, 10% a year? Or could you, could you do that if you went and looked back at your budgets and your numbers of indictments? Right. Well, the problem is that our, our budgets are actually been getting smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had the fortune in these last five and a half years have to deal with sequestration and deal with, so our budget's actually been shrinking. Uh, uh, with all the cuts coming coming from Washington, but the increases uh, have increased. I mean, obviously, there's always going to be an increase. I, which is what makes it difficult. It makes it challenging for for all of us to do our to do our jobs. But uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you right now. I can I can look for that and find out if I can get a hold of that number. But uh, I wouldn't know right now how much yeah, the, no, the cost of it increasing year by year. It, it it would be very helpful information if you could give us that sure. information in the future. All right, well, we're at 5.40, so we've run a little bit over time. What I do want to say on behalf of all of the committee, 
thank all of you for your time. Thank you for your candor. Um, we are here for facts and, you know, to discover the facts. Um, I don't know exactly where we go from here um, on some of these issues, but we may follow up with any of you um, if we have further questions to try to, you know, get, get the facts and flush them out. So I hope you'll uh, keep your doors open to us. But thank you very much for your time. I um, mean, we appreciate you being here. Um, my understanding is there is a reception um, outside. I believe it's right outside these doors. You guys would probably know better, Judge Scola and yes, Judge Graham. Right but I do want to invite everyone. It's my understanding um, that you're all invited, and uh, the committee is certainly thankful for that, um, and we would love to be able to talk to people. All the attorneys those. that are here or any observers are also welcome to stay for the reception also. Thank you. All right, all right we stand in recess till tomorrow morning.